Welcome everyone to the fifth and final Ada Lovelace Day 2020 webinar. I think this is the one that a lot of people have been looking forward to, uh, Space, the, uh, the next frontier. Um, and I'm delighted to have with us um, some fascinating people working in space. We have Michelle Hanlon, uh, the president of For All Moonkind, uh, Verania Ishada Navarro uh, at the Mexican Space Agency, Alyssa Saints, the um, robotics flight controller for the International Space Station at NASA, and Dr. Jahera Sierra Sastra, the project manager for the Mars Spring Tires Sample Retrieval Lander Mission at NASA. Um, we have an amazing conversation lined up for you. Uh, if you have questions, please ask them in the comments on either Facebook or YouTube, um, and I will be monitoring those and replying uh, where possible, and then we will pass those questions on to our fabulous speakers. Um, and enjoy the hour. I will pass you over now to our moderator, uh, Michelle. So thank you all for being here, and I look forward to the conversation. Well, thanks so much, and boy, at a lovely state, uh, what a what an honor it is to be here and to celebrate women and oh my, these amazing women in STEM. I'm just a lawyer, so I know that, uh, that I'm not as interesting to uh, to most of the listeners. I just let me. I am the co-founder and president of For All Mankind, which is the only organization in the world that's focused on protecting cultural heritage in space. And people don't often think about it, but think about things like the Apollo 11 lunar lander. Um, you know, we're going back to the moon, we're going to Mars, and there's stuff there that we should keep that we need to protect for our history. I'm also the co-director of the um, Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi, where we're really focused on looking at the policies and laws and regulations that we need to get humans into space sustainably and successfully. So we're really, focused on what does it mean to become a multi multi-planetary species? Um, what do we need to put in place here on Earth? Obviously, we, we don't get it right on Earth all the time, right? And so we're looking at the ethics of human rights in space and, and how we can hopefully build, I mean, when, when we won't have a utopia, um, but you know, what, what can we do to make our experience in space diverse? and uh, sustainable and successful. So that's me in a nutshell. And I'm gonna sort of ask all of our panelists to um, introduce themselves, tell us the work they're doing. And also, in, as, as you're talking about your work, sort of see what, what the, your vision for your work is in the, in the grand scheme of human exploration of space. Um, if I can just start by saying, a uh, good friend, Frank White, who wrote The Overview Effect, he starts his conversations with with uh, in, uh, groups like this by saying, uh, who wants to go to space? And you know, everyone raises their hand, I do, I do. And he says, well, congratulations, you're, you're already there. I think we humans forget that we are a part of the cosmos. We are a part of space. So it's not out there, it's all around us and we're part of it. And it's really important that we treat it as if it is part of our, us as well. So with that, um, I'm gonna start just with um, Alyssa, if you would mind. Um, talking a little bit about your work and yourself. Sure, and great words, Michelle. And I think you're selling yourself short. We are all super excited to hear your take on things. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Alyssa Sines. I am a robotics flight controller for the International Space Station here in Houston, Texas at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm originally from El Paso, Texas, and moved to College Station, Texas, to pursue a degree in aerospace engineering. Um, in 2017, I graduated with that along with my minor in astrophysics and started working at NASA's Johnson Space Center um, right after graduation. And I'm currently working on my Master of Engineering in Space Operations out of University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So still a student and still trying to learn as much as I can. Um, and I'm, a, like I said, a robotics flight controller. So I support uh, mission control, real-time operations um, here in Houston, but that's not the only thing that flight controllers are responsible for. Um, in the world of robotics, we are constantly making or installing new payloads. There might be a new cargo vehicle we need to make new trajectories for. So we produce a lot of procedures to ensure that our uh, space robots that are external to the International Space Station are maneuvering safely and efficiently um, outside the space station. And um, that's a little bit about myself and I will pass it over to Dr. Yahida. Thank you, Alisa. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you. My name is 
Dr. Yahaira Sierra, and I am the project manager for the Mars Spring Tire. This is the team responsible for the design, build, and testing of the new uh, rover tires. Tires that will be incorporated in the rover that NASA and the European Space Agency will be sending to the surface of Mars in 2026. So this is a rover in charge of collecting and catching the samples that Perseverance rover will be picking up on the surface of Mars. Uh, so very excited, very exciting work, developing technologies. I am a material scientist by training. Now I lead teams and I lead projects and manage projects, but I am a material scientist by training. And I have had the, the fortune of working in multiple and diverse uh, fields of research and industries in the area of materials, not only materials applied to space, but materials with a lot of applications here on Earth. And now I am living my dream of developing technologies, new technologies that we will be sending to Mars and technologies, uh, rover technologies and wheel technologies that we will soon be sending to, to the moon as well. Fantastic. Uh, Farania? You're, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I'm in Mexico City and it's really noisy, but how are you? Thank you for uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for the audience. Uh, I'm so glad to be here with my amazing female colleagues. Uh, my name is Verania Echaide Navarro. I have a bachelor's degree in communication and physics. I work at the Mexican Space Agency at the Industrial Development Area. And currently I'm uh, studying my bachelor's degree in physics, in particle physics. So I'm collaborating with CERN at the Alice, the Alice experiment, uh, looking for strange particles. I'm also involved in projects for, uh, or in order to, in order to promote a uh, science for for girls and, and for all the the audience. Uh, and I'm a mentor of UN. Uh, Mentor of the Space for Women project uh, of UNOSA. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. So I have, a, um, you know, just sort of thinking about all these experiences here. I, I wonder one one question that before we sort of launch into the substance is, um, you know, to start with Alyssa, what, what does sustainability mean to you with respect to space and, and the work you're doing on ISS? And I know, for example, um, one thing, you know, we talk in preservation, we talk about when ISS is decommissioned, you know, oh God, what's gonna to happen to it? You know, and a lot of people wanna see it sent into a graveyard orbit and protected. But what, what does sustainability mean to you and what does it mean with respect to the work you do? Yeah, so um, I think, you know, the ISS, um, it's been up there for 20 plus years now. And, and we have done so much amazing science on the ISS. That is its, its main objective is for us to learn as much as we can about um, our technologies and about how the human body reacts to long duration um, uh, space missions. So we can take those experiences and those technologies and that are proven and reliable and then apply them to a long duration space mission. So, I mean, the ISS has played and will continue to play a really important role in getting us ready to go back to Mars, getting us um, back to, um, or not back to, but go to Mars for the first time and then get back to the moon. Um, so as far as, you know, um, what are we doing in the world of like robotics, the field that I work in to um, get us ready for those missions? Well, um, to give you an example of something that uh, we're actually executing next week, um, we're doing a kind of a demonstration mission called the Robotics uh, Refueling Mission. And this is essentially testing the capabilities of can we take a cryogenic fluid and be able to store it, be able to transfer it, and be able to uh, replenish a satellite, service a satellite, and maybe eventually the next big step would be to service a spacecraft, a human-grade spacecraft, um, using robotics. So. This is something that um, we're doing in, in uh, conjunction with Goddard Space Flight Center, and they are the ones that built all the tools um, for this demonstration mission. And um, now we get to use our space robots on the ISS, which is Canada Arm 2 and Dexter. And um, 
test these capabilities for future missions. And this in long term can help us um, extend the life duration of a satellite in orbit, right? So we have thousands of satellites orbiting us um, that give us GPS um, and um, that enable us to have communication to the ISS and to other satellites. Um, and so if we can extend their life duration um, and also develop tech this technology to eventually service a spacecraft, because we all know it takes just enough, enough propellant just to get off the face of the Earth. And um, this capability could allow us to refuel a spacecraft and send it on its way to Mars. So um, that's a pretty interesting um, mission we have actually coming up next week. And you all can definitely um, go look it up. NASA has some cool videos and articles on this mission. It's called RM3. Um, but yeah, I mean, the whole point of space station is to build reliable technologies that will enable us to go farther and farther. I think um, it's a really, the other thing that um, Station does so much that we can transfer back to Earth here, right? A lot of the, the research that you do mm -hmm. has helped so many things on Earth. But um, I think, um, uh, Jahara, uh, I do, I study the plume effect on the moon, right? Because it's, um, it can damage the Apollo sites and so forth. But I know we have the same issue on, on Mars. And I think it's fascinating that you're working on the wheels because our, um, one of the concerns on the moon, right, was that the wheels were, they were kicking up too much dust and making the um, rovers uh, not work properly. But I actually had a, a, a I'm gonna pull you a little bit more into the sort of the ethics part of it. And you're building a rover to go to uh, Mars. Do you think humans should go to Mars or, or, or what, what would humans bring to um, planetary exploration that robots don't? Yes, I, I believe that yes, we both humans and robots should go to Mars. Uh, we are sending robots now. And as Alisa was discussing, you know, the important topic about sustainability of space, when I think about sustainability um, in space, I think about how to develop, build technologies, develop technologies and send technologies responsibly to make discoveries in a responsible fashion and in an efficient way so that we can uh, leverage, you know, and, and, and use resources more efficiently to continue discovering our solar, solar system and way, way beyond our solar system. So when we think about developing a rover that, and, and wheels, so that that rover traverses, you know, the rocky terrain on Mars. We are thinking on how we could develop a technology that will make the energy uh, that this rover consumes more, like less, or 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 we, that we will see power efficiencies. And this, this is just an example of of, of a way, you know, of uh, implementing efficient um, ways of, of doing discoveries and, and sending technologies to, to the red planet. But we also need to, need to think about, you know, how we will discover responsibly because part of this mission will be uh, to send this rover that will pick up these Martian samples to actually look for signs of life. So planetary protection, it's a key requirement for our mission. We are concerned about and, and need to take into consideration how our technologies need to protect planet um, uh, Mars, but we'll also need to think about once we return those samples back to Earth, how we are going to prevent um, uh, forward, backward contamination of the, of the different planets. We want to preserve, if there is life on Mars, we want to preserve it in, in the way it is. We want to respect it uh, because the, the key objective of the mission will be to answer very fundamental questions for humanity. So we don't want to compromise that. And that needs to be done responsibly. And now we are sending rovers. And in the meantime, we will learn through technologies how we will be able to responsibly send crewed missions to the, to the surface of Mars so that the same ideas and principles of protecting this planet, this red planet can be implemented, can be, uh, uh, can, can be the guiding you know, principle for, for discovery on the surface of the planet. So lots of things about, you know, developing technologies um, uh, in an efficient manner, you know, like what astronauts will eat, what astronauts will wear, um, like how, how trash, you know, will be, will be uh, reutilized or, or, or managed on the surface of the planet 
of a different planet. So all, these are all questions that are very relevant, not just for the sake of um, protecting the planet or, or, or just protecting the planet or furthering you know, our understanding of, of the universe, uh, but it's, it's, it, it's in our best um, interest, right, to, 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 to protect to protect our nature, to protect the, the, the planets in our solar system. Absolutely. I should mention that Verena is in uh, Mexico City, which is undergoing some bad weather. And so she had I'm worried that she was going to blip out with her internet and hopefully she'll be able to join us again. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to, now that we know, like, you know, how fascinating what you both do is, you know, and, and I, you know, my, am I the only person who cried when uh, they, curiosity or it was a curiosity opportunity you know said it said its last transmission um how how would you um how did you get into this like what uh listen did you would did you always love space um were you always science minded um how, how did you come to work on iss i mean to me it's a dream job both of you have dream jobs to me but yeah no definitely agree i am at my dream job right now so it's it's a great feeling you know I don't drive into work right now, but when I do, you know, going through the NASA gates and I always pass the Saturn V rocket on my way in, it's, it's always kind of a surreal moment. Like this is my job, this is what I get to do every day. Um, but I was definitely interested in space as a child. I can recall in fourth grade specifically, I remember like getting to the science portion, or sorry, the um, space portion of our science textbook and studying the planets and just being, really fascinated um, by them. And I could never wrap my head around, you know, the size and the vastness of the universe. And that kind of captiv captivated me from a young age. And and even till now, you know, I still can't really wrap my, my head around it. And I think that's what keeps me so curious about space. Um, but to be honest, I, I didn't know what engineering was at the time. Um, and it took me all the way up until my senior year in high school when I really started doing the research, trying to figure out what I wanted to major in in college. And I knew I had this love of space. I knew, you know, NASA existed. And that's kind of, you know, um, when you're a space nerd, that's kind of the dream. You want to go work for NASA. And I just didn't know how I was going to get there. Um, but at the same time, I really liked understanding how things worked and how things fit together. And so I eventually came across aerospace engineering. Um, and I realized it was a combination of the two things I was interested in, you know, immediately the word space caught my attention and I started reading into it and um, realized that was going to be my ticket, my ticket to NASA, I needed to become an aerospace engineer. So um, from that moment on, I started looking for schools that I could go get my aerospace engineering degree at and that's what eventually led me to Texas A&M. And I'll be totally honest, you know, when I'm talking to students, I like to be transparent. My um, first couple, my first two and a half years at a and were definitely a challenge. Um, I think coming from high school, you're used to understanding concepts and, and getting good grades. And all of a sudden you're in a new environment with a new curriculum. And um, there was multiple times in my undergrad where I questioned, is engineering really for me? You know, it's, sometimes it's, hard to relate to your classmates, um, especially being, you know, a, a woman in aerospace engineering, there was very few of us. Um, and so I really had to battle through a lot of self doubt um, in some of those initial classes. And luckily, I had really awesome friends and family that kind of, you know, encouraged me to keep going and brought me out of those um, low moments. And thank God they did, because I never would have, you know, made it to my dream job had I switched out or gone another path. And I think I had made this box inside my head that this is what an aerospace engineer has to do. I'm going to be sitting at my desk doing calculations all day. I'm going to be co coding 24 seven. And these just weren't things that I really enjoyed. And I thought, well, this is what my major does. So this is what I'm going to have to do. And, um, you know, I eventually learned that there are a ton of different jobs you can do as an aerospace engineer, as an aerospace engineer, ended up taking a human space flight operations class taught by a former astronaut, uh, Greg Chamatoff. And um, that really opened my eyes to the world of real-time operations where you have to have an engineering understanding and an engineering background to work on these systems. Um, but you're the one that is operating those systems. You're the one sending commands to space. Um, 
And in my role, you have to be good at communication. You have to be good at coordinating with people. And so I really saw a flight controller as kind of honing all of my skills and talents and things that I enjoyed um, into a job. So once I discovered that, I was like, okay, that's what I want to do. I want to be a flight controller um, for ISS. And it just so happened that there was an opening in the robo group when I um, was applying and um, so glad it ended up working out like that because I have really enjoyed working in the world of robotics. A really cool thing about the robo group is that we're a joint group between NASA and the Canadian Space Agency. So um, for those of for those of you that don't know, the space robots we have up on ISS are Canadian built, so Canada Arm 2 and Dexter. And so I have colleagues up at CSA I get to work with every day. So we're definitely one of the international groups and I really enjoy that coordination um, with our Canadian colleagues as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of how I got into it. It just turned, you know, me loving space, me trying to figure things out. And I discovered aerospace engineering and kind of ran with that, but there was lots of moments of of doubt for sure, but I pushed through and I'm glad I did because I really do love what I get to do every day. So I would like to just add, you know, I think a lot of people think of oh, space, NASA, you know, if I'm not American, I'm not going to be able to do anything. But, you know, just today, the um, seven countries announced that they had signed the Artemis Accords. So there's going to be tremendous international collaboration. So if you're in Canada or the UK or Luxembourg or Japan or Australia or I don't have all the countries in front of me, but, but there's going to be more countries. You know, this is a real push to make um, space an international endeavor. Um, and so if you're not if you're not in the United States at Texas A&M, uh, perhaps you're in the UK or in, or in Canada, you can um, come in through. But Gateway, which is going to be the lunar orbiter, which is going to be the gateway to the moon and to Mars, will uh, hopefully have a lot of international parties and participants. Um, but Tahira, I want to ask, um, material engineering so to me that's one of those things that's like oh like how did how does that get you into space and and what you're doing with the uh, with the wheels yeah excellent question yes so i have always been passionate and fascinated about space exploration so i i am one of those people that since since I was five years old i have been wanting to be an astronaut i even apply i have applied several times to the NASA astronaut candidate program and have been part of this highly qualified group. And uh, prior to NASA, I, one of the, my space related projects was a uh, Mars analog mission. So I was able to live my dream, astronaut dream here on earth uh, when I joined a crew of six scientists that, that lived and were like astronauts in Hawaii, in Mauna Loa Volcano, Hawaii. Uh, so I have always been fascinated about space, but I can tell you that my path to NASA was not a linear path, was not a linear path. So I say, I like saying that I became a scientist growing up and this, um, making discoveries in, in the backyard of my house. I, I come from Puerto Rico, an island in the Caribbean, uh, surrounded by beautiful mountains and beaches. And that nature, that landscape really still in me, that, that passion for, for, for the universe. So that watching the stars, you know, in the middle of the night, all those experiences really sparked in me that, that passion or interest for, for science and, in, and the universe in general. Um, and I became a scientist since, since I was very little, like, going and, 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 and working in science fair projects. Um, so I knew that I wanted to pursue a college career in something related to science or engineering. And, but I was not quite sure, you know, what path or field I was going to choose finally. So at first I decided, okay, so let me, let me start civil engineering. And I started as a civil engineer student at the University of Puerto Rico, Mayagüez. And then realized that mm, this doesn't necessarily, you know, fit uh, my maybe my my style. And it was that first general chemistry class um, in college that really inspired me and motivated me to pursue a bachelor's degree in chemistry. So my my first scientific identity is I, I am a chemist. I am a chemist. But it was not until I had my first research experience um, uh, during, during a summer 
um, that I discovered and was able to see the, how we can apply chemistry to develop, design smart materials, materials with very unique uh, functional properties. So that's how I, I started, you know, learning, you know, about, about the field of materials science, the field of material research. And remember, back in my head and in my heart, I still had that dream alive of, I want to be an astronaut or I want to work for space or work for NASA. But I think it, like my life and my career path has been driven by just this spirit of curiosity and, and just splutter by nature. So I got, you know, like redefined my passion at the moment and said, you know what? I like materials. Let me study materials. Went ahead to, to, to complete graduate studies in material science. And, and after that, um, still, you know, thinking and looking for opportunities to apply to space, the opportunities did not, you know, did not materialize at the moment. I applied for positions at NASA several times before getting the job at NASA. Uh, so I had to reinvent myself and be open to the opportunities that came my way at certain times in my career. So I can tell you, I have done a, a lot, many, many different things. I have been a teacher um, at a high school, a university professor. I have also worked as a researcher for nanotechnology, nanoscience companies, small companies. And, um, and now I am at NASA after trying and trying, you know, with those applications, and, and a key, a key factor for, for getting a job at NASA is that I never, I never gave up first. And second, I, anytime I would go to a conference or meet people from NASA, I would just share my passion, excitement for space, what I wanted to do. And when you share that with others, people see that, yes, you, you are serious about those goals. And that's how I eventually ended up. People knew that I was dying to, 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 to contribute to the space agency and, and contribute to, to space technologies. And that's how I ended up at NASA. But it was not a linear path. And that's OK. That's OK. And I am glad that Alisa uh, highlighted at the beginning, you know, Michelle, um, you as a, as, as a you're an attorney, right? Like mm -hmm. you said. We need all types of people, all sorts of fields are represented in the space industry. We need diversity of thought. And that's, that's what it's going to take us to Mars, to Pluto, beyond our solar system. So all careers are welcome. Here, Alisa and I shared a STEM career interest, but we need lawyers, we need uh, social workers, we need psychologists, we need medical doctors. We need artists. We need educators, communicators. So let's 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 think about that. I would say just there will be a moment in your life where a, an opportunity may arise, and if you are open to it, that opportunity will take you to a second opportunity. And the most important thing is not to give up your dream. If if your dream and passion and focus is let's say space, find a way to get there. But enjoy the enjoy the process enjoy you know those experiences and and try to always apply you know any any opportunity that may come try to think about what skills can i gain what skills can i develop that then eventually when the opportunity arises to work for the space sector i can apply and that's exactly what happened to me i i developed myself as a scientist a material scientist with the tires we are looking at materials unique materials that will make these tires more durable uh, to traverse the rocky terrain, uh, materials that, that will help that rover traverse the surface of Mars. But I also, as part of my previous jobs, I also developed leadership skills, people skills, and all, the, all those skills together, it's what make me a good fit to the position I am right now where I am leading teams. I am a leader um, of, of this amazing Mars Spring Tire team. I think so, so inspirational. I think um, I w I'll jump in a little bit about myself now too, because I think, you know, students always ask me, um, you know, I wanna go to law school, I wanna be a space lawyer, what do I need to do? What should I study in college? And I always tell them, study what you love in college because mm -hmm. you wanna enjoy the experience and you wanna get good grades because that's what's gonna depend on where you go. And so I know, Alyssa, your uh, your experience is a little bit different because you have to, you struggled a little bit with 
with what aerospace engineering really meant, but you mm -hmm. eventually defined it yourself, right? Um, so I think this this curiosity is the most important thing mm -hmm. that anybody can have in any in any position, especially with respect to space, because there's just so much we don't know. And I I laugh at my students because I have the first year of law school is very rigid and this is the law, this is the law, this is the law. And then they get to me and outer space law is basically five treaties. And they say, well, wait, there's no there's no law for this situation. And I say, well, that's right. It's your job to figure out how the law should evolve to deal with that mm -hmm. situation. So I, um, I, um, I'm the mother of two engineers, but I'm not an engineer. My, um, I grew up with uh, Star Trek and my, my mom is Chinese, my dad is Polish. I lived overseas my whole life. And I just, what I loved about Star Trek was the diversity on the bridge. It was really, it was the first show that I saw that I was like, oh wow, I could do that, I could be that. Um, and so, you know, I grew up with uh, space books. Um, my father was a space nerd, um, but I got to high school and, you know, I was defeated by calculus. And so, uh, you know, I just, I thought, okay, that's not gonna work for me. Um, I enjoyed, fully enjoyed as a poli sci major, fully enjoyed being a lawyer. I spent 25 years as an M&A attorney, nothing related to space at all, okay? So mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't start space law until I was 50. So, you know, you, you can do anything at any age, right? So I went and I got my master of laws in space law from McGill University. And um, I started for all mankind. And now I teach space law and aviation law at the University of Mississippi. Um, and so that's how I got to where I am. So I said, um, I was going to say, yeah, I see the, um, the, the question now. I just wanted to sort of interject because well, let's move into more of the mechanics. And we have a question about how does the new Mars wheel differ from the 1971 moon and 2018 Mars wheels? This is an amazing question. So thank you. Thank you for that question. So the Mars spring tires uh, or Mars spring tire technology makes use of shape memory alloy materials. So we have a tire that is a, is a woven mesh, a mesh made of springs, and those springs are made of shape memory alloys. Uh, shape memory alloys um, are materials that have the ability to uh, deform reversibly. So they we will be able to stretch the bonds, atomic bonds, and then have that material go back to its original state. Um, it's a material that can withstand uh, large deformations compared to steel, compared to steel. So in terms of like differences between these uh, Mars spring tires and the lunar tires of the lunar rover vehicle, right? Um, so we know that uh, back in the days during the Apollo era, uh, the lunar rover vehicle made use of flexible tires. The Mars spring tire is a flexible tire. Um, so the difference is the, the use of these springs and these new material, shape memory alloy materials. And the difference between the Mars spring tire and the Mars wheels that are already on, on the surface of Mars, for example, the Curiosity wheels, is that Curiosity um, and Perseverance, they, may, they use rigid wheels. They, they use rigid wheels. Um, so the difference here is, and, and, the, and the driver here is for, for technology development, is to develop wheels that will be able to traverse different types of terrains. And we know, as a matter of fact, that Curiosity wheels um, experience some damage after one year on the surface of, of Mars, because Mars terrain is not easy. So we are looking at basically reinventing the wheel for space. <laughs> Uh, looking back at that technology from the lunar rover vehicle and redesigning it, um, optimizing it, but optimizing it with novel materials, new materials, and new new architectures like the like the use of of springs uh, that made that tire match. So we hope that this material will solve like a lot of the issues associated with. Um, you know, lim limitations about, you know, which terrains a rover can traverse, the distance that the rover can traverse. So hopefully we will be able to establish a heritage for, for new tire technologies that will help us traverse longer distances, go, you know, faster on the surface of, of Mars or the moon. So those are some of the similarities and differences between, between the technologies. 
Thank you for that. So I, I was wondering, I wanted to go back to Alyssa for a second. And I think, you know, um, we know that Tahira uh, was a Mars analog and tried, uh, you know, uh, applied for the astronaut program. Do you want to go to space? You know, I do get asked that question a lot. Um, but honestly, I have never had like, you know, a, pa a dying passion to become an astronaut or go to space. I'm perfectly happy supporting as ground support for mission control. Um, I mean, also never say never. Um, who knows, you know, what will happen or come for down the road. But uh, yeah, right now I'm definitely perfectly happy just supporting for mission control and supporting our crew up on the ISS. and. I do hope to be a part of future missions um, to the moon and beyond. You know, um, there will likely be a, another version of Canada Arm that's going to go on the Lunar Gateway. So if I can stay in the world of robotics, but maybe move over to um, the Gateway one day, that would be awesome. But um, I kind of, you know, live by never say never. Um, and we'll see where my career takes me in the next 10 or so years. So the, sort of for both of you, it's so interesting that you're both involved in robotics, but one is in or orbital robotics, I guess, and you can tell I'm a lawyer now. And one's on planetary <laughs> robotics, right? Um, the, they're very different, right? I mean, so what, um, I have a question here, what are some of the unsolved scientific problems in your area? So when you, Alyssa, like when you, what is, you know, we just heard about the um, amazing work Tahir is doing to uh, create new heritage for the for the wheel. Mm -hmm. Or um, you said it much more eloquently. Um, what what are you facing? You know, with respect to the robotics work you're doing on ISS. Yeah. So um, great question. Um, so for ISS, obviously that's in low Earth orbit. So we have. Um, pretty solid communication to um, ISS. So we can send a command for mission control here in Houston, and immediately we can see that command we sent in our telemetry, and we get visual confirmation from our video downlinks that we get as well. And a challenge going forward when we have a robotic arm um, orbiting the moon, or we have a robotic arm on its way to Mars, is now we are gonna have a comm lag. Um, that is going to prevent us from getting that immediate confirmation that our maneuvers are operating as we expected them to. So there's a lot of um, verifications we have to go through because the International Space Station has you know, so many external po components to it. There are antenna zones we have to watch out for. There's the uh, Japanese arm that is moving um, as well external to the International Space Station. So there's a lot of moving parts and every maneuver we do, you know, we triple check that um, we're sending it to the right spot. We have uh, verifications before we even go on console and mission control. We run all the trajectories through our planning software and make sure that everything is meeting our flight rules. And, and that's all with having that immediate verification. So again, when we are going to have that calm lag, when we're orbiting the moon or when we're on our way to Mars, we can't necessarily do that in real time like we do right now. Um, so that's eventually going to look like, um, you know, we're gonna have to make software innovations and updates. So the computers aboard the Lunar Gateway um, are the ones that are doing those verifications that flight controllers would normally do in real time, but we just won't be able to have that, you know, the calm necessary to do the, the confirmations like we do currently. So that'll definitely be something um, going forward that um, we'll have to kind of figure out how to get around that. Um, and they'll, you know, it's not gonna be a copy paste of the International Space Station arm. Um, it's going to, um, obviously be new technology because the SSRMS, or I'm sorry, Canada Arm 2 and Dexter, they've been up there since 2000 and 2008. So um, they are awesome robots, we love them, but they are not, you know, brand new at this point anymore. And so when we do send up Canada Arm 3 and other versions of the uh, robotic arm, then that's gonna be newer technology, newer software that is gonna build off of what we currently use. Um, but there'll be different flight rules associated with the different environment that those robots are going to be operated in. Oh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just switch gears a little bit again because I, I want to. Um, uh, part of the reason we're meeting is to sort of inspire people with their stories, right? And so, um, Tahira, you were you were talking about a very sort of. Uh, uh, 
winding path to where you are now. But um, what's been your biggest hurdle? Like we, Alyssa talked about sort of having to overcome this understanding of what what aerospace engineering meant to her. What about you? Because you, you make it sound like it was just, you know, wow, great, great opportunity, great opportunity, great <laughs> opportunity. <laughs> uh, no, not at all, not at all. So. Uh, so ba back back to the years of college, right? So I, I mentioned that I decided back then to pursue a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Um, but I remember the, the I remember times where my crew, my uh, classmates, and I would experience you know challenges understanding or seeing the the relevance of some of these scientific uh, chemical concepts, right? The re the relevance of of the, of the courses. To, to real live applications, let's say. So thinking about that back then, it occurred to me that what I wanted to do was to revolutionize this, the way science was taught. And that, that was what drove me and led me to also complete uh, courses in, in science education or chemistry education. But I can tell you that um, after college, my first job was uh, as a high school chemistry teacher, but it was a temporary job. I love my teaching job. I love my teaching job. And up to this day, I say I am a scientist and I am also an educator. I love, those are my two passions, greatest passions. And um, it was a temporary position. What that means, that at the end of the semester, I was without a job. I had to reinvent myself. I had to look and seek for other options. That need was what led me to going online and started looking for research opportunities back then, research opportunities for teachers. And that's how I ended up being selected for this summer research experience for teachers. That's that's the, the experience that I shared earlier where I discover this new passion for material science. And um, again, it, every time I have decided of pursuing a different field, or of learning new scientific concepts is challenging. It's, it's, it's really challenging because it requires first determination and an and, 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 and ability to basically decode like, like the, the, the language of that particular field. So that has been and was challenging at times. You know, there were times as Alisa was saying that, you know, I questioned myself and said, you know, do I really fit here? Am I really capable of, of doing this or that? Um, but I will say the, mo the, the most challenging language <laughs> that I had to, language barrier that I had to overcome was, was English, believe it or not. Um, I, I, was grew I, I grew up in Puerto Rico. My first language, native language is Spanish. I, I, call, I, came, I come from a very small town where we didn't speak English at all. Uh, so when I started looking for opportunities to pursue a graduate uh, a graduate school um, um, here in U.S. mainland, then I had to overcome my my English barrier. So that was not easy. I started graduate school with still not being too fluent in English, um, but nothing is impossible. I think those those difficult times and challenging times is what has helped me just become like very resilient and adaptable to change. Um, but again, as, as it happened with the, with the, te with the teaching uh, position, um, the, you know, I, I had to reinvent myself. I, I took that opportunity to, to, to participate in the Mars Analog Mission, which, which required me to take some time off from a, from a full-time job. To, to be part of this mission. And then after the mission, I had to look, okay, what am I going to do now? And that's what, how I ended up like teaching for one year before taking a position um, in the federal government here in, in the United States in an area that was not related to space. Again, because I would, I would look for space jobs and I would apply it. And sometimes I would not even hear back from, from, from those applications, but it was, it has been challenging, but at the same time, I have I have decided to to adopt this mindset of just take it as a challenge and get the best you can from each opportunity that that you you welcome um, in your life. So that's how you know from working um, for a different federal agency in the in the U.S. government 
not related to space. Um, we, I was developing technologies uh, to for uh, anti-counterfeiting technologies for US banknotes. Um, but that experience of project management, technology development, how we mature technologies, how we, uh, here at NASA, we use TRLs, technology uh, readiness levels, to define the, the level of maturity of, of technologies. And those concepts, even though they, they were outside the space sector, the same type of concepts and, 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 and mindset, right, of solving technological issues, challenges, um, it, this is the, the same mindset and skill, the one that now I apply to NASA, to my dream job and, and, and dream, you know, space job at NASA. So I, I um, my biggest hurdle to overcome. So when I was an attorney, an M&A attorney, business attorney, um, I worked in back rooms. You know, I, the biggest uh, audience I ever had would maybe be a boardroom with 12 people in it. And I was the attorney, so everyone sort of listened, right, because I knew the law and nobody so when I um, started for All Mankind, um, my husband uh, said, uh, well, you have to be the face of this organization, so you have to go and give presentations um, back. So for All Mankind is only three years old. If you go back to my first presentation, I think, I think the entire podium was shaking. I was so nervous about speaking in front of people. And so uh, it, for everybody out there listening, you know, look at me now. If you had told me three years ago that I would be moderating a panel like this, I would have I would have just laughed at you and walked out of the room. So that's what I had to overcome this sense that um, I am a support player. I'm a supporter. And now I realize, no, I'm a leader. I created this um, organization. And within two years, we became a permanent observer to the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. You know, you can do this. Um, all you have to do is put your mind to it put yourself out there and make yourself uncomfortable. I think that's the biggest thing is, and I think all of us here have been really, really uncomfortable in a place you know, that, that we put ourselves in, right? And so you're sort of sitting there like, why did I do this to myself? And then you think, well, I know why I did this to myself because it's gonna make the world a better place or mm -hmm. because it's gonna make what I do so much more important and so much more meaningful. Um, so with, with that sort of uh, segue, um, I want to go into just, uh, we don't have much time left, we, um, be, because we're supposed to talk about sustainability and ethics and so forth. And so I want to think about um, ethics for a while and, and the um, with respect to ISS, of course, we worry about debris, right? Um, orbital mm -hmm. debris. And the, the uh, what, what, what should humans be thinking about in terms of stuff we put in space, whether it's on orbit or on another planet. I mean, we have, for example, a lot of commercial companies now saying, hey, we'll take your ashes to the moon and they'll lay there forever. You know, is that, do we have the right to do that to the moon? Um, what do you think, Alyssa? Yeah, I mean, um, just like we, we look at the earth as being, you know, this really precious thing that we have to take care of. I, I believe the same thing for the moon and for um, the other planets that we want to um, eventually explore. Again, like I was just so fascinated by um, by space and by really the beauty of it. Like if you just look at, you know, Jupiter or Saturn, it's, it's kind of insane that that is real, like something that beautiful in our solar system exists. And, and because of that, you know, we, we want to take care of of our solar system, we want to take care of our own planet, obviously. Um, and so, I think, you know, as the issue of of more and more space uh, debris, uh, it becomes a more pressing issue. It is something that we need to um, take take care of. I can say that the ISS, you know, it performs um, uh, maneuvers to avoid any space debris. We have a whole um, console dedicated um, to tracking. Um, debris in um, in the orbit near ISS. And there's a whole set of procedures we have to go into if um, there is going to be a conjunction, if a piece of space debris is going to come, you know, a little too close for comfort and um, we'll have astronauts step into those procedures and we'll perform the maneuver if necessary. And, um, you know, it seems like we're having to do those maneuvers more and more these days. Um, and, you know, that is putting our floating laboratory that we have you know, devoted so much of our time and our efforts to at risk, and it's putting our planet at risk. So I think, you know, it is 
absolutely important that we are taking care of um, our low Earth orbit and we're taking care of the um, eventual, you know, celestial bodies we'll go and explore. And so, and Jahira, so that's sort of the same question. I mean, right now there's there's not a lot of hardware on Mars, right? But that's going to change. I mean, are there any, are you, is NASA or are you thinking sort of of, of that day when there's, you know, rovers bumping into each other on Mars and, and what, like, <laughs> do you give thought to what is happening, like with what's going to happen, what's going to be left? Obviously, I'm going to think it's heritage and want to protect it and, you know, build a museum over it. But, um, but it's, you know, it's a very real issue as more and more nations, as it becomes cheaper to get to the moon or to Mars. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts on it is that, and this is, this is my personal take on the matter, I believe on the importance of international cooperation so that we increase our understanding, we bring diverse perspectives, and then the decisions that are made about what is ethic, ethical or not uh, to do on the surface of the pla of planet Mars or, or, or other planetary surfaces represents, represents the diversity of humanity. That um, those decisions that are made, uh, those um, uh, decisions that are made about what what should be done or not be done um, are not influenced by the bias that a selective a group of people can bring to the table. So the more different uh, world, uh, worldviews and viewpoints that we can bring to discuss these, these very important matters, I think the better. The, I think we, we will be able to, as, 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 a, as, a, as humanity, we will be able to collectively answer these tough questions, right? These very, very tough questions. So it is my understanding that uh, for, for discoveries on the surface of, 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 of Mars, um, parties are coming together. There are international agreements about how we will protect regions on, on the surface of Mars that are of scientific, uh, high, high scientific importance and, and interest because there are, there are regions on the surface of the planet, on, on, on the planet that may have uh, those uh, either um, uh, the keys of, of past life or, or there, there may be life, there may be life. And those are, need to be protected. So that's, that's where when we think about, you know, going and discovering, um, we engineers, we need to work with our planetary protection officers. We need to work with our planetary protection experts just to make sure that in the process of building this hardware, we are meeting requirements to not bring contamination to, to the red planet and vice versa. Um, when we think about sending humans to Mars, the same, the same thing will happen. I have heard dialogue about, you know, how should we approach the disco discoveries on the red planet? Should we send uh, robots first before uh, uh, humans go? Should we send both? Uh, those are still questions that need to be answered. But for me, the, the most important uh, or the key aspects of answering those, those questions is that we will bring different types of people and, and that we will embrace different world, uh, uh, viewpoints about it so that um, the decision you know, about what is uh, right or wrong is not is not biased based on just a selective group of people. I think that's a really good point, and and that's something we're work, working really hard. Um, one of the things that For All Mankind wants to do is to universalize the concept of heritage. You know, we think about uh, Neil Armstrong as being the first human on the moon, um, and we want to expand that. So it's not he's not he's not American. He's he is like the embodiment of three millennia of human mm -hmm. achievement, right? Because you don't get Neil Armstrong on the moon without um, our ancestor three million years ago standing up on two feet and freeing uh, his or her hands to make tools, right? So that that moon landing is really sort of mm -hmm. the, all of our experience all wrapped up together. And that's mm -hmm. starting in Africa and Egypt and Mesopotamia glass and so forth. So I think it's really important. I'm glad that, you, you know, the concept of what, how we do this has to embrace diverse opinions. I see there's a question from Lorna Richardson about how do you get private companies to care about things like biological contamination or space debris? I don't know that you get them to care, um, but the Outer Space Treaty does require, as long as a nation is um, a party to the Outer Space Treaty, 
Article 6 requires that it license, it license and properly supervise um, all of its nationals. And so most spacefaring companies are parts of our uh, nationals of countries that have signed the Outer Space Treaty. So anything that a nation can't do, and the Outer Space Treaty says um, you, the Outer Space Treaty Article uh, uh, 9 actually has uh, this harmful contamination. You will not contaminate another planet and you will not um, uh, bring a contaminant back like uh, Jahir was talking about in the beginning. And so um, we don't have hard law about orbital debris, um, but we have soft law um, guiding principles regarding um, planetary protection um, that's, that are uh, implemented through COSPAR. Um, and we have orbital debris mitigation guidelines um, that were um, created by the UN Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And so I will say the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space is one of the best collaborative agencies within the United Nations. And it has done a brilliant job of keeping the peace in space since it was formed in 1957. Um, and so, the, you know, through that, although we don't have any hard treaty law since the 70s, we have a lot of principles and guidelines that most spacefaring countries abide by. Um, the I guess that at the moment, these decisions are mostly made by scientists working for the government, but at some point you see those decisions being out of scientists' hands. Um, so we're gonna wrap up with that question, but the, um, do you feel like your those decisions are in your hands? I was, <laughs> I think uh, I think the questions of contamination and are very much policy driven questions, um, and the governments are bound by the Outer Space Treaty, and it's and it's for progeny um, to to abide by what the um, what our uh, you know the negotiators back in the 60s decided would be important. You know the Outer Space Treaty talks about the peaceful uses of outer space. And so that those concepts of contamination, uh, debris mitigation, um, but mostly mostly the outer space treaty is concerned about peaceful uses and the non-militarization of space. And so we have just about three minutes left, and I'm going to do a lightning round of who has been your role model and why, and then we'll close out with that. So Alyssa, we have to start with you again. Yeah. yeah um, so um, growing up, um, um, I think I hear an echo a little bit. Um, uh, there was a um, someone from my hometown named Ginger Carrick, who was the first female Hispanic uh, flight director um, at here at Johnson Space Center. And she's actually grew up in the same area of El Paso that I did. We went to all the same schools. So I heard um, her name a lot growing up. And um, she was someone I looked up to. And, you know, she grew up in the same type of environment I did. So it was kind of like, uh, you know, if she could do it, I could do it type of thing. And um, now it's cool because we work, we both work at Johnson Space Center and someone I look up to is now, you know, a colleague and a mentor and we see each other and um, we say hi and get to chat. So um, she's definitely been one of my biggest role models and and um, it definitely proves that representation does matter um, because I saw her coming from my community, going after her dream and she was able to accomplish it. So I went after mine as well. Fantastic. Zahira? Excellent. So I would say uh, I I would not choose today to 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 highlight a sci scientist, you know, role model, um, because my main role models have been my mother, her passion for education, her uh, work ethics, uh, and all those principles and values that she she taught me about. You know, the value of hard work, the value of serving others the value of doing things with a purpose. So I am I am living and try to honor her by living uh, and, and letting those principles guide me in, in, in the in the work that I do at NASA. And and my abuelita, my grandmother, who did not get uh, the opportunity to go to school, uh, doesn't have any any uh, degrees. But my grandmother it's it's it showed me and taught me as well. Uh, the value of, of, of bringing, you know, uh, the, the, the having good, good, good values, you know, and, and honesty and, and loyalty and all those good values that we can, we can put to better serve our organization. So th those two are my, my role models. That's, yeah, I, if we're running out of time, I will just say I, um, I went through life sort of thinking, oh, I just, you know, need to make money and, and, and exist. And um, when my children were born, I realized I, I wanted so much for them. And, and then I realized, well, if I want it for them, why don't I want it for me? 
Um, and so I, I would say my, my children are my role models because they, they have the support to go out and do anything they wanted. And I think that that is what's most important. I think, Alyssa, you, you started off the conversation by saying, you know, that you just, you find what you want to do and you realize you can do anything that you put your mind to and that you Definitely. want. So. Well, um, I just want to say thank you so much to Alyssa, Michelle and Jahera. I'm so sorry that we lost Verania um, to the gods of the internet, um, but Thank you for watching everyone. This is uh, the last moment of our Ada Lovelace Day webinar spectacular. So thanks to our speakers, thanks to our viewers and happy Ada Lovelace Day. Thank Goodbye. you. Bye-bye. Thank, right, thank you everybody.